Hi everyone, my name is Beatrice Åkerblom and in this video I will present the paper Reference Capabilities for Safe Parallel Array Programming that I wrote together with Elias Kastegren from the Royal Institute of Technology and Tobias Vrigstad from Uppsala University. The work presented in this paper revolves around the array data structure and we suggest how we can achieve safety in form of data race freedom when using arrays in parallel programming. We have done this in the context of a language aromatic that's presented in the paper. The array is a fundamental data structure with contiguously stored data that allows a random access to individual elements. The same sized element stored can either be pointers or references to other data, like the array at the top of the page, or we can store primitive data as we do in the array at the bottom of the slide. No matter what we store, access is just a matter of indicating what number in the sequence of elements we want. If data is stored in large arrays, the operations we perform can often be performed in parallel, but to avoid data races, the programs must be written with much care for the coordination of accesses so that two threads running in parallel never operate on the same elements. This can often be achieved by letting each thread keep track of its current start and end index, as we can see on this slide. T1 will operate on the indexes 0 to 3, whereas T2 will operate on the indexes 4 to 7. Both threads will, however, in reality have access to the entire array, so the programmer has to make sure that no errors are made in calculating the indexes. And in addition, if we store non-primitive data, the index checking is not even enough. Since we can have references to the same element in more than one location in the array, the array in the slide has references to the same object in the index 3 and 4, and since index 3 can be found in the range operated on by T1, and 4 is in the range operated on by T2, data races could occur even if the threads stick to using their assigned index ranges. In this presentation, I will show you how we have used reference capabilities, a construct that has been used before to statically guarantee the absence of data races in object-oriented program by combining concepts such as uniqueness, read-only access, immutability and borrowing. We have extended the concept to support concurrent and parallel operations on arrays of both primitive and non-primitive values. I will then show you some operations that can be made with array capabilities. And I will also explain our key invariant, the disjointness of arrays that will be maintained throughout all the splitting and merging operations allowed on an array capability. The starting point for all of this is the Kappa type system that Elias has written a bunch of papers about. Kappa is a capability-based type system that can guarantee data race freedom for concurrent object-oriented programs, even in parallel programs where object may be accessed concurrently by mutating operations. A reference capability is a special kind of reference that can be used to control access to a certain object, and it also controls what kind of operations the holder of that specific reference capability is allowed to perform on the object. In this slide, we see the reference capability X, that is a reference to an object of type T. The reference capability is annotated with the mode linear, which means that no other references to this object are allowed, and in turn, since the access is exclusive, can allow mutating operations on the object through X. This way, reference capabilities can be used to guarantee absence of data races by making sure that there will only ever be one single reference to a certain object, or the reference capability can permit aliases, but as a consequence, limit the access to only allow reading of the object. The core of this, very condensed, is that if Kappa allows the thread T1 to execute x.f and the thread T2 to execute y.f equals 42 in parallel, we can be certain that x and y are not aliases to the same object. The core contribution of this work is the array capability. An array capability is similar to a reference capability, but it also supports operations for dividing it into parts in different ways. 
An array capability is an abstraction of an array, as we can see in this slide. It consists of a physical layer, which is an actual array, and a logical layer that may or may not give access to all the elements of the physical representation, and the ordering of the elements may differ between the physical and the logical representation. And in reality, the logical layer consists of a reference to the underlying physical representation and a function used to translate the indexes. For a newly created array capability, this function will always be the identity function, which means if we look up AC0 indexed by 0, we'll translate that to 0 and find number 12 here. Using the array capability operations may, however, change the initial state so that the physical representation and the logical representation no longer look the same. There are other operations available as well, but split and merge are the ones that will actually lead to transformations at the array capability level, and we'll take a brief look at how they can be used. The first operation is split. Splitting converts one array capability into several sibling array capabilities. Each of the siblings will have exclusive access to some indexes in the original array. The partitioning of a split is logical, that is, it happens at the capability level, and the underlying array, the physical representation, is never affected by splitting. We'll see how this works in more detail in the coming slides. But if we split the array capability to the left, by two and consecutive, the result will be two new array capabilities, one with the first three elements and the second with the remaining two. Whereas if we split the array capability to the left by two and strided, the result will be two new array capabilities, one with all the even index elements and the second with all the odd index elements. The second operation is merge. Merge combines two or more array capabilities to form a single new array capability with access to all the indexes that the parts had access to. Like split, merging is logical, meaning that the newly created capability simply acts as a proxy for the underlying array. Merge can use concatenation to simply join the parts in sequence after each other as we see here. These two array capabilities are merged with concatenation to form a single new array capability with all the elements in sequence. So we can use an interleaving merge to weave the array capabilities together by first taking the first element of all incoming array capabilities, so 12, 23, and then the second from all incoming array capabilities, 34 and 45, and so on. If we split an array capability, in this case, AC0 into two new array capabilities in a consecutive way. The result will conceptually, in the programmer's mind, be the situation to the right in this picture. The new array capabilities will have their own length. They will both act as if they were indexed from 0 to length minus 1. But what really happens is something like this. The original array capability holds a reference to the underlying physical representation that will not change, and it also has a translation function that returns the same index as was asked for. After the split has been performed, the two new array capabilities will still hold references to the same un unchanged underlying physical representation, but the translation functions for the array capability AC2 will have been changed and replaces the index 0 by 3 and index 1 by 4, which will lead to the right elements in the underlying array. Similarly, we can split an array capability in two by using a strided split. Again, the result will conceptually, in the programmer's mind, be the situation to the right in this picture. The length of the new array capability are again individual, but the biggest difference is that the first one of the new array capabilities contain all even indexes from the underlying array, while the second one contain all the odd indexes from the underlying array. And what really happens is something like this. The original array capability still holds a reference to the underlying physical representation that will not change, and the translation 
function that returns the same index as was asked for. After the split has been performed, the two new array capabilities will still hold references to the same unchanged underlying physical representation, but the translation function for the array capability AC1 will have changed to return the index value multipl multiplied by 2, and the translation function for the array capability AC2 will have changed to instead return the asked for index multiplied by 2 and increased by 1. Once we have split an array capability, it is possible to merge the siblings in different ways. In this slide, we see what happens at a conceptual level when we do a concatenating merge on AC1 and AC2, which will give us AC3. AC3 will still have the same physical representation, and the new array capability again contain all the elements from the physical representation, but the order of the elements is different and an index translation has to be made between the logical and the physical representation. So what really happened is something like this. The array capabilities we merge both hold references to the same underlying physical representation that still will not change, and their respective translation functions. After the merge has been performed, the new array capability will still hold a reference to the same unchanged underlying physical representation, but the translation function for the new array capability AC3 will have changed to contain both translation functions from AC1 and AC2, and also subtracts 3 from the index to reach the elements that used to be stored in AC2. Another operation that we haven't talked about before is the align operation. It differs from the other two in that it doesn't transform the array capability's logical representation. It simply pushes the ordering of the elements in the logical representation down to the physical representation. But again, what really happens is something like this. The array capability we align originally holds a reference to an underlying physical representation and a function that is used to translate indexes. After the align has been performed, the new array capability will hold a reference to the reordered underlying array that now has the same order as the logical representation used to have. And the translation function of the array capability will have been replaced by the identity function. The key property of aromatic, however, is that evaluation preserves this jointness for all array capabilities. This is based on the fact that all newly created array capabilities always are given the unique mode. Remember from when we talked about reference capabilities, unique in aromatic is similar to the linear mode discussed then, and linear means that no other references can be pointing to the same array capability. In addition to that, whenever a split or merge operation is performed, the original array capability will be destructively read. That is, if we do a two-way consecutive split on this array capability AC0, AC0 will have been erased when AC1 and AC2 have been created. Remember that this is the logical layer, the actual array will not be affected. Moreover, all array capabilities created by split operations will always be disjoint. That is, a split of x into y and z is only allowed if the translation functions sigma1 and sigma2 have ranges that do not overlap. So the overlap between the range of sigma1 and the range of sigma2 must be empty. The only way we can share a reference to an array capability is by using borrowing. Borrowing is a well-known technique for making programming with unique references useful in practice, and its use in aromatic is really similar to its use in kappa. Borrowing a capability creates a temporary copy of the capability, not the underlying resource. The original will be hidden or buried, and the copy is qualified as borrowed, which binds it to the stack, that is, that it cannot be stored on the heap or in a global variable, and so on. 
The lifetime of a borrowed copy is tied to a particular lexical scope, like this example on the slide, where a copy of B will be available through C within the block framed by the curly braces. That C is borrowed will be tracked through its type, and splitting and merging C inside this block will preserve its borrowedness. At the end of this borrowing scope, all temporary capabilities are guaranteed to be dead, which means that we can reveal the buried capability B and reinstate the original variable and clear the borrowed type qualifier. And by that, we can conclude and prove that two non-buried array capabilities in the system either refer to different arrays, refer to disjoint parts of the same array, or can only be used for reading. I have presented a new type of reference capabilities, the array capabilities, that can be used for logical splitting and merging of arrays. I have also shown that array capabilities preserve Kappa's guarantees of freedom from data races. In the paper, you find more examples, the formalism and the full proofs of progress, preservation and array disjointness. Thank you for watching.